All right, guys, we're going to be on page 40 in the textbook and page 35 in the ring binder. 40 in the textbook, 35 in the ring binder. All right, so that's just glow germ. That's a lot of fun if you guys ever want to do that. But some of the kids will do their, like, little science projects at school and, and do stuff. But it gives you an idea of how easy it is to transmit things that we don't want to have um, on ourselves. Um, the, we'll start off, first of all, with a couple terms that I want you guys to know. And the first thing I want you to know is a microorganism. And again, these are in your ring binder and in your book both. But a microorganism is something that you cannot see with the naked eye. Um, it is everywhere in our society, in our life. There are good microorganisms and there are bad microorganisms. And obviously our concern in healthcare are bad microorganisms. Once we classify them as a bad microorganism, we use the word pathogen. And a pathogen is one of the microorganisms that can be harmful to us. Doesn't mean it will be harmful, it can be harmful. The reason I say that is because influenza, flu, seasonal flu, that's definitely a pathogen that can be harmful to us, but does everybody get flu every year? No, okay, so it may or may not harm you. Then we have to differentiate between sterile and aseptic. If I want an environment to be sterile, I don't want all microorganisms gone, like in an operating room. If I want something to be aseptic, kind of the lay term for that is clean, then I want the pathogens gone, even though I realize that there will still be microorganisms involved. And so most of what you do, when you guys wash hands, you are basically practicing aseptic or asepsis techniques, okay? And that word has been on the state exam before, so you might want to highlight that one, asepsis or aseptic. And I think the question is something like, you know, which of the following is, is a form of practicing medical asepsis? Of course, the answer is hand washing. Um, so we want to make sure in healthcare that we are protecting ourselves. I mean, it's important to protect our patients, but it actually, believe it or not, is more important that you protect yourself because if we lose you in healthcare, then it really doesn't matter. There is a chain of infection, and I've given you a handout in your ring binder as well as it's in your book, and it kind of illustrates what happens with this process. And the first chain or link in this chain of infection is what's called the causative agent. That's a fancy word. We're going to call it the bug. What is the actual causative agent? The two things we're seeing in the upstate right now that we'll use as examples, one is influenza, which is seasonal flu, and one is norovirus, which is the pooping and puking virus that people have got going on now. So those are two causative agents that are out there. Now each of those causative agents have to have a reservoir, also known as a home. To live in. So in our influenza, the reservoir for influenza is our respiratory tract. It's why if you get flu, you have the cough, the congestion, the respiratory symptoms, the fever. If I get norovirus or enterovirus, my reservoir is my intestinal tract. So I'm vomiting because the body's trying to rid itself of that bug or having diarrhea as a result of it. Result of it. The next link is it has to have a port of exit, or we're going to call this a door out. So if I'm going to cough and spew all over you, that is my port of exit, those respiratory droplets that you're going to get. So I'm breathing those out. It might be body fluid. That would be my port of exit, the vomiting, the diarrhea out of the system. Then we have to have a mode of transmission, and that's how we're going to travel. Are we going to travel by direct contact, droplet, body fluid? Is it airborne? How is it going to transmit? So right now, I could have influenza. It could be living in my respiratory tract. If I cough and spew those respiratory droplets and you are close enough to my airspace and you breathe in, that is the mode of transmission, that I've coughed that into the airspace. This is considered the weakest link. 
meaning that if I can break any of this chain, it's got to be how I give it away. Because I'm never going to eradicate influenza. I'm never going to eradicate norovirus or enterovirus. There will always be those pathogens, those bugs. Because they'll always be there, they'll always be a reservoir. Because there'll always be a reservoir, there'll always be a way for me to give it away. But I want to eliminate actually transmitting it to you. So if I knew today that I had flu, and I didn't come to class, and I stayed at home, and was around nobody, did I give it away? No. It still had a port of exit through my respiratory droplets, but I didn't transmit it to you. So this is where we try to break that link. The hand washing, the covering our mouth, the, the tissues, the gloves, anything I can do. The next chain is called the port of entry, which is my door in. So again, are you going to re re breathe my respiratory droplets? Are you going to touch my bloody fluid? Is it going to go in through your skin through direct contact? How is it going to get into your system is my port of entry or my door in. And then the last one is called susceptible host which is, will I get sick or not? Okay. So being a susceptible host, the individuals that tend to be the most susceptible are first the very young, because they don't have an immune system yet, our children, are very old because they have other underlying disease conditions and their immune system is compromised. Those individuals who have not chosen to take precautionary measures, like taking flu shots, or vaccinations of some form or fashion. So what makes us susceptible or not, a lot of that plays into that. If you guys stay in healthcare, if you work in healthcare for a very long period of time, particularly in a setting where you're around sick people, I mean, my background is in emergency medicine forever, I have been exposed to so much that fortunately, I am a very low susceptible host to anything. I don't even get a cold. I can't, it's probably been 10 years or more since I've even had a cold. And that just kind of blows my mind, you know, to think about, whereas most people get an average of three colds a year. But the more exposure, my body begins to develop those immunities, um, and it begins to recognize that, and I'm not as susceptible. We, I do take, choose to take the flu vaccine because if you work at GHS and you don't take it, you don't have a job. Um, but there's things that you do to not make you success, susceptible. If you look at seasonal flu, about 30% of people in the U.S. are going to get seasonal flu every year. I mean, 70% of us weren't susceptible, because I can tell you it's not that 70% of you were not exposed. Because if you go to the grocery store, the Bon Secours Center, to church, to daycare, I don't care. If during flu season, you, in some form or fashion, got exposed to influenza, 70% of the people in the U.S didn't get the disease, didn't get the illness. So we're fortunate that there's not high susceptibility. The other thing that plays a role in this is do the causative agents, are they a fixed genetic makeup or are they capable of reorganizing their genetic makeup? The reason that we do a flu shot every single year is influenza is so smart. It's like having a deck of 52 cards, and I take those cards and I shuffle them, and that would be seasonal flu this year. And next year, I take the same 52 cards and I shuffle them, but it was able to reorganize or reshuffle just enough of the genetic makeup that it required another vaccine in order to hopefully decrease my chance of being susceptible. Now, there's some things that weren't capable of remaking their genetic makeup. Polio is an example. We're very fortunate that we learned what polio was. It had a genetic component. We realized a vaccination. It wasn't capable of reorganizing or reshuffling its genetic makeup. So thankfully, we eradicated it. And like anything, I know things can come back. But in essence, polio has been gone for a very, very long time. Um, things with colds and stomach viruses, same sort of thing. They have an incredible ability to resort their genetic makeup. So we're not going to be able to figure out how to not get sick with those for the typical individual at some point um, each year. The ones that we're getting concerned about are those that have no treatment. Those things that we either can't cure or treat or we can't change the outcome. And one of the biggest ones that's out there that everybody's hearing about in the news 
computer and healthcare is MRSA, it's MRSA. Um, and um, MRSA is a form of a staph infection that has managed to figure out how to be resistant to traditional antibiotic therapy. So all of us at some point have had a staph infection. If you had a mosquito bite and you scratched it and it got infected and it had a little pustule on it, the likelihood is that was staph. If you had acne on your face and there was drainage, that was likely staph. But this is a different staph. This is a resistant staph. And we're seeing more and more of it in the community. When we first started dealing with the first scary disease process, I would say in my career, the first scary disease process was HIV, was AIDS. Um, and that's really when we started the whole gloves and being concerned about all the body fluid issues. But as a healthcare provider, I could kind of look at that and say, you know what, I'm a little concerned about that, but I'm not personally concerned because I don't have IV drug use in my history. I don't have multiple sex partners. I don't practice homosexual activity. So I had the areas of risk not associated with my lifestyle, so we weren't really, I wasn't concerned. MRSA is not that way. And anybody at any given time can get MRSA, and the population of people that are getting it aren't our people choosing poor lifestyles. The number one population of people getting it is our children in daycare. And so they get on the changing table, somebody hasn't cleaned appropriately, a child had an open oozing lesion on their buttocks, a boil, it was transmitted, and the child comes home and a couple days later has a boil or a little abscess on their buttocks. Um, it gets hard and pustulized, usually it opens or gets lanced and drains, um, and then fortunately it kind of dries up and goes away. But if that is MRSA, you now have MRSA for the rest of your life, okay? That is, you have it. Um, so kids are, are a huge, our daycare population. The next group of kids that are getting it a lot are elementary school kids. And what's happening there is the PE teachers pulling out the tumbling mats, and we're going to do a tumbling module this month. And these kids are rolling and tumbling all over the mats, and again, it just takes somebody who has an lesion area of direct contact on the mat, and they're getting it. Then we go to our high schools, and we're looking at our athletic teams. We have two, well last year, we had two football teams in the community that every member of the football team, varsity football team, had MRSA. Two high schools in Raymond County. Okay. Like, Gosh, that's horrible, yeah? But between showers and equipment and things that get put on that are in direct contact with the skin, with helmets and pads and so forth, mm -hmm. they became at risk. And I venture to say that if they look closely, we'd probably see entire wrestling teams with the same idea, that they're on those mats, They've got the same sort of risk associated with it. Colleges, same idea, and then obviously into our workout gyms or our fitness facilities. So is it a life-threatening disease? Like what is MRSA? It sounds like, like a skin right. condition like right. in most, Yeah, in most situations, it is not life-threatening in most scenarios. In most scenarios, it presents as a boil or abscess, usually in areas like the armpit, groin, or the buttocks area. It's painful. It does have to open and drain or be drained. They do have an antibiotic that colonizes it. Again, some of these words are more than you really need to know, but just to kind of understand, they've come up with an antibiotic, uh, Bactrim or Septra, that's managed to figure out how to kind of colonize it or make it dormant. And so it can dry up and get better, and you think, oh, okay, that's cool. And then three months later, you have an outbreak and you're trying to figure it out. It just was a period of dormancy or colonization. Um, kind of, I hate to use the analogy of herpes, but it's probably the best analogy to that. When people have genital herpes, you have outbreaks. And then there's a, a medication, an, an antiviral acyclovir. You take it, you take that genital herpes and you colonize or make it dormant, and you get rid of the lesions, and then six months later you have an outbreak because you still had that. Is normal staff like that too? No, no. Traditional staff is not that same risk associated with it. And traditional staff, thankfully, typically even responds to topical things like a neosporin, polytrim type of a topical antibiotic. Yeah. I know in hospitals they have like a sign on the door like, um, to let, let you know, like, do you need protective equipment? Do they do that in nursing homes? Yes, they do. They do. In the nursing home, if somebody has MRSA and has an open lesion, there will be a isolation 
box hanging on the door and it has gowns and gloves and it has the signage on it. There are also, most hospitals now are actually when you're admitted, most hospitals are swabbing your nasal passages and just running a test to see if you have MRSA because for the first part of all of this, we were really looking to hospitals to have caused it or you had a hospital acquired MRSA and, um, and so now they typically will do that and unfortunately on your chart, <laughs> In the hospital setting, once it's on there, it's like HIV or hepatitis, or you're going to have it flagged um, as MRSA. And that's really, again, to protect the healthcare provider. I mean, we always should be careful, but there is a, a form of protection that you need to take. So it's not spread like a like HIV or anything, it's spread? No, it's direct contact with the drainage associated with the lesion, and then you obviously have to have a port of entry, so you have to have a break in your skin. Again, it's why we're seeing it in daycares, because kids keep little breaks in their buttocks with diaper rash so frequently that that's an easy port of entry for those kids to get that. Yes? Do insurance providers cover? The um, another very good question. Um, originally, when we started looking at this, we were culturing everybody. If we were draining it, we were culturing it so we could label it and know what it was. Um, and then there was that typical fear factor associated with it. So most of the time now, they'll say, yeah, it looks like a form of staph and we're going to treat it, but they don't label it MRSA or even say that to the parent, uh, which I don't think is fair. Uh, again, it comes back to the pre-existing condition. Luckily, it's a cheap um, disease to manage because again it usually is isolated to more skin disorders managed by Bactrim which is heap antibiotic and typically does not get in the bloodstream in the lungs in the brain those so are obviously lethal but usually does not insurances do cover that they are to cover it yes okay. they are to cover it yeah. so how do you treat with those in your nose the swab just swab in your nose but do, do the actual bacteria the MRSA live in your nose yeah they can actually grow it out from your nose in some patients. Mm -hmm. yeah. If you have the flu, it's probably dumb, but if you have the flu, and when you were saying you stay home and you don't touch anyone, and then versus the person that does give it away, is it shorter? Okay, that's also a good question. Let me explain something about influenza that also, influenza is smart. It's one of the smartest <laughs> pathogens out there. Influenza, when it's in your system, it's in your system 12 to 24 hours before you have the first symptom. So here's the problem. Somebody right now in the class could have it, is not sick at all, is giving it away to us, and there's no way to know that. Um, the medication for influenza, which is typically Tamiflu, the antivirals, you see all the commercials for it, Tamiflu stops the replication of the flu virus. So once we know you have the flu in your system, if we give you the Tamiflu, we stop the ability for it to spread and replicate. And again, it's why on the commercials it says you can get better you know, a day faster if you take Tamiflu because it will you know, stop the spread. The problem is, is if you've already had the flu for two days, then it's already pretty much replicated to the point that taking the medication is not gonna get you better faster. I don't know if that kind of answers your fast mm -hmm. question. The other thing that goes on with flu that's very misleading, and you guys may have been patients that were subjected to this, but somebody in the family has flu, and they give them Tamiflu, and they say, hey, let's go ahead and treat the whole family so you don't get it. That is such a lie because you have to have flu for Tamiflu to work. You have to have flu in your body. You may not be sick yet, but you have to have it. So the premise that we've led people to say, that mean, uh, we've led people to think that it's prophylactic, meaning preventative, and it's not. Um, and we've led them to believe that. So everybody's calling going, oh, we got somebody sick, we don't want to get it. But you have to have it. You just might not have the symptoms. So the premise is, if she has it, she has three kids. There's a pretty high probability that they have it, they're just not sick yet. So I give it to them, the rest of the household, because they probably have it, and I'm going to stop this replication of it. But if they didn't have flu in their system, you just spent the money and gave Tamiflu unnecessarily. And again, I venture to say in 10 to 15 years, we will have influenza that is resistant to Tamiflu. We will have forms of influenza that are resistant because we've just used it crazily. When um, my daughter, a couple months ago, and she had the flu, I took her to the, her doctor and he told me that there's no point to even give her Tamiflu because if you don't give it to her 12 to 24 hours before, it doesn't do anything. Right, right. And the thing too is that with children, 
Tamiflu, the two side effects in kids is vomiting and hallucinations. So you have to decide if you want your child to puke and hallucinate to get better one day faster. <laughs> you know, so there, there's just a lot of misinformation that goes out there about this stuff, and we need to be really good and diligent about being good about the information. There's another one that you may be here. Oh, did you have another question? Yes. Okay, for people that get MRSA, what do you do if they can't, like, be treated with um, antibiotics? Because, like, <coughs> When my son goes to the doctor, because his pulmonologist had him on an antibiotic that he already takes three times a week, they're saying giving him another antibiotic is not going to do anything. You just have to let it run its course. So how do they treat MRSA like that? You don't want him to get you just you don't want to get sick because the other problem is a lot of people are allergic to sulfa. Yeah. And Bactrim is a sulfa-based antibiotic, and it is the drug of choice for MRSA. So you run into that same dilemma is what do we do? And they're using alternatives and you know a lot of times again it will colonize just if you've got a recent immune a reasonable immune system. But I mean there are people that will lose extremities because if MRSA gets in the wound and gets in the bone and you know you can actually have an amputation as a result of it. Because I mean he's allergic to penicillin and amoxicillin. Yeah. He can't take Bactrim. Oh. He can't take um, what is it? You better Septonar. put him in a bubble. Septonary, yeah, septonary, yeah, septonary. Yep. Put him in a bubble. No. <laughs> that, I mean, that is, no, that's scary. That's he scary is. because you're taking the top five antibiotics and saying no matter what he has, strep, ear infections, all of that, he's not gonna be able to take it. It's because of his allergies. Yeah. 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 The other one that you might hear something about is something called VRE. And you guys don't need to know the whole long thing for this, but I'd like for you to hear it. VRE is vancomycin resistant endoorganism. Vancomycin was an antibiotic that was developed that we were so excited about because it was the big guns and it killed everything. It got gram negative and gram positive and, um, and it was, we were so excited about it and it was given IV and it worked fast and now we have people that are resistant to vancomycin because again, of using it. So, um, you know, we've, we've got problems in healthcare associated with all this. Even when it's infused over, you know, like, is that the one that has to stay um, cool and you put it in the little infusion thing and it infuses the Right, and, then, the right, and then, they, then they have to draw blood work right. for peaks and troughs. And, yeah, right. yep. So there's, I mean, we're, we're trying in healthcare to find mechanisms to, to treat. So what are you guys going to do? Let's, we're going to be super careful and we're going to practice good aseptic technique and we are going to learn to apply and remove personal protective equipment appropriately. Know the abbreviation PPE. PPE is personal protective equipment. Um, I told you guys on Friday that Matthew's favorite phrase is, if it's wet and not yours, wear gloves. You know, that's pretty basic, but that's pretty true. If something is wet and it didn't come from your personal body, then you probably need to have gloves on to avoid any kind of direct contact with that body fluid. Um, it doesn't matter if it's vomit or diarrhea or blood products. You want to make sure that you are safe. Urine, so forth. So you guys will be learning how to put on and take off personal protective equipment. Um, one of the things that you'll use a lot of is gloves. When we did the activity the first day, we saw I think there's nine skills involving the use of gloves. Keep in mind that these gloves are considered aseptic gloves. They are not sterile gloves. So they're clean, free of pathogens, but not sterile. So again, putting them on, the application of them, just very simple, nothing special about getting the gloves on. But once they are dirty, we need to make sure that we understand the concept that dirty touches dirty and clean touches clean. And so if I have poop from this brief change on both my gloves, I want to make sure that poop touches poop, not touches skin. So you guys are going to learn, and we'll watch it on the video and practice a little bit later, but to grab the palm of one hand, dirty to dirty, and pull this glove away from my skin. Then I want you to get in the habit of wadding this up in your hand, make the small diameter here, so that when I go under this glove here, because I want clean hand touching clean skin, I can turn it inside out on itself, and now when I touch this, this was against my hand, which was in theory clean. Right? So we're going to use that technique every time we remove gloves. Now you will see, wait so many. Um, you'll see people that don't have good practice of wadding that first glove up. So I'll do this in slow motion. But if I pull this off like this, 
you will see staff have like that and they'll just reach under here to try to turn it on to itself. The problem is, if you slow this down to ensure that you're not touching dirty, this is what you have to do. That's ridiculous, mm -hmm. okay? Why have to stretch your glove? Because you got the glove flailing around, okay? So the point to wadding that up is just I can make it so much easier when I take this off to just pull it on top of itself. Okay, so those are our gloves that you guys can work with. You also may be working with forms of masks as a form of personal protective equipment. This is called an N95 mask. Um, this is the um, mask that is used for the smallest of respiratory particulates. This one specifically is for TB, tuberculosis. Um, so if I have somebody who is a TB risk, I'm going to use an N95. This is going to go around my mouth and nose. It's going to go over my head. It even has a wire in here to make a good fit. And I want to breathe through that in order to not acquire that infectious process through that. If you're working with splash risks associated, labs, traumas, I mean this is you know the trauma bay, we may have goggles on but we may just have a face shield on. This is for eye protection or things getting in your mouth, hopefully not, but that's one of the things that you may see as well. Um, the last one, just realized I didn't pull out. Uh, the last one is called a gown. And just know these are cheap because they're training gowns. Um, but with a gown, again, the idea is that the part facing the patient or the client is what I want covered. So again, these are just clean or aseptic gowns. So we'll learn to put these on. It'll have a tie, and you will tie at the top. This is the part that people go, oh my gosh, this is the hardest part. I never tie without watching my shoes. So figure out how to tie that close. Then take your gown, try to overlap as much as you can back here, because I want my clothing covered. The tie's in the front, take it around and tie across the back. So now if I have to go in a room again where I may come in close contact, I'm not going to get this up against my clothing, particularly if I've got to continue to work and go into other rooms. If you're gowning up 99.9% .9 of the time, you're gloving up too. Okay? If you have enough risk that you're wearing a gown, so when you put the gloves on in this scenario, I'm going to make sure that the cuff of the glove goes over the cuff of the gown. So that if that body fluid runs down my glove, it is staying on the outside, not going down in. I can do that on the same way. So this is one of the skills that you potentially could draw. And it's called donning, which means to apply personal protective equipment. There's a word called dolphin, which is removing, donning and dolphin personal protective equipment. So again, she'll watch you put this on and then she'll watch you take it off. Now, again, you'll have to assume that everything is dirty. Right? So I'm going to start with my dirty gloves and I'm going to remove them the way we just said. Grasp the palm of the hand, wad it up, under, turn it inside out. Okay? Now my hands are clean. What part of my gown is dirty? The front. The front. Maybe the sleeves, okay? So I'm going to go behind me and I'm going to untie each of these. Hopefully they're not in knot. I think I've got this one in knot. If that happens the day of the test, you have my permission to just break the strings because <laughs> you'll be stressed. Okay. All right, so once it's untied, now I don't want anything on this outside to touch my hands. So I'm going to reach in the inside of the gown, what was on my clothing. Just grab a big wad of it from the inside and turn it on itself, okay? And then grab this side and do the same thing. Turn it on itself. And as long as I keep my hands here, everything that I'm touching was on my side, okay? And then again, dropping it in the, in the trash can. So the gloves, you have to do it from the bottom well, I guess you can do it from the top. The thing, the biggest thing is it just says slips fingers under the glove. But I guess if you, I think that's harder though. Is that what you normally do? That's what I do. Or just you've seen people do? No, I think I did it last time on the side or something. 
Like when I think that's only a little bit harder because we were so, measuring the um, so. uh, I mean, I guess you could. Try the other way just to see how it feels. Yeah. Um, would we need a mask when we had to do that if that was our skill? Okay, good question. It depends on, well, for the skill, no. If you draw the skill, what you saw me do is what you'll do. Gown, gloves on, gloves gown off for the skill. In the real world, it depends on what the infectious disease process is, and you likely would also have a mask on. How come you wouldn't do it for the skill since Because they don't want to. Because they don't want to see you put a mask on. <laughs> Again, it comes back to what are they looking for that day? What are they testing you on? And they're testing you on gown and gloves, not mask. Okay. Now there are two terms also to be familiar with: standard precautions and transmission-based precautions. And these should be in both your book and your ring binder. Um, in your textbook, it's on page 43, about two-thirds of the way down. Standard precautions is what you do every day of your job to protect yourself, whatever you need to do to, to be safe. Transmission-based precautions are in addition to standard precautions when there's another agent of concern. So if I had not treating somebody with lice, is gloves or even gloves and gown enough? No because I'm going to have to deal with bedding and linens and pillows and hair and brushes and combs and all kinds of things. Or if I have TB, is just gown or gloves enough? No. They need to be in a negative pressure isolation room and I need to have a mask on. So standard precautions are the traditional everyday what you do. Transmission base is when there is a disease process or condition that requires something above the standard precautions in order to be safe. Do you see TB in the nursing home? We have not seen it, but we had TB in the elementary school in Greenwood last year. Really? Mm -hmm. In several yeah. cases of tuberculosis in elementary school in Greenwood last year. So we do still see it. Again, fortunately, it's treatable. I mean, it's scary, but it's treatable. There's, there, a lot of things are treatable. Uh, all right, the last part of this discussion is what do you do about using um, vaccinations that are available to you to make you less susceptible as a host. First of all, you're going to have to decide what's right for you on some things okay, in terms of vaccinations. However, most employers now in hospital settings are going to require that you take a seasonal flu shot and you take the hepatitis series. Most of them are not going to let you remain employed if you do not. There is a human resource department that will let you bring your religious preferences and you have to validate and you have to substantiate that you've practiced that way and it's a huge, big ordeal to do it. It's possible, but most people just say, you know what, I'm going to do it and I'm going to follow what the recommendations are and try to stay safe. Which hepatitis? Like a? Um, hepatitis C is the one that the three boosters are for, which is what they usually will always provide, the, they'll pay for. Um, I know they are obviously dealing with other concerns with hepatitis, but hepatitis C is the one that they have been, hospitals have been most willing to pay for. Most hospitals will pay for your um, TB shot, and your, uh, not TB, your uh, PPD, you know, gosh, DPT, DTAP, diphtheria, pertussis, tetanus, because we're seeing pertussis again, or whooping cough. So they usually will cover you for that. Um, flu, hepatitis C, um, they do require that you have a TB test every year just to ensure you don't have TB while you've been working in the environment to prove that you are still negative. And now they require the chicken pox um, titer to see if those of us that just got the vaccine when we were a year and they didn't ever think you had to reboost us again, we now know that a lot of people need to be reboosted, um, but they do that. Yes? If you have the chicken pox, can you get them again? No, it, well, let me rephrase it. You can get the same agent that causes chicken pox, but then you get it in the form of something called shingles. Um, and shingles is chicken pox after you've had chicken pox. And so most of our adults are getting shingles if they're getting re-exposed. They're not actually getting full-blown chicken pox. Yeah. Um, I thought it was hepatitis B that you get the three shots. It's over the six months to see if you can me into it. Or is that different than hepatitis C? I'm pretty sure C is what we got at the hospital. I'll double check that for you, but oh. I'm pretty sure C, C was the series that we got to begin with to okay. for employment. But I will double check. I'll double check. Well, I almost got a couple of the hand forms and stuff got messed up, but I, was, I think it was me that they offered me. They offered you B at GHS? Yeah. I'll double check. I know where my daughter works is advertised B. Huh. All right. I will definitely check that for you, and I will have an answer.
Yeah. Yeah. Fine. Yeah. And, and I'm wondering. It says, if, well, it says in, in the book, Kachan have feet. Yeah, but the thing, I mean, mine was so long ago, I oh. wonder if maybe it was C, I wonder if it's now B, and not, maybe I'm even not in compliance, I don't know. I guess I probably should check that, because I, I mean, because mine was literally probably 20 years ago when I had to take my boosters for GHS. My sister caught chicken pox more than once. Chicken pox? She didn't get it as shingles? No, she got it in high school, was the last time she oh. had it. She oh. got it when she was six, and then she got it again her senior year of high school. Very unusual. Very unusual. Now, kids can get a small crop of chicken pox from the vaccine, and then they still have a 6% chance of getting chicken pox even though they've been vaccinated. So some people will call that two forms. Like they yeah, got she had it really bad. Oh, wow. That's rare. That's she very still rare. got some of the, um, you know how they, yeah, they swell up and never go down? Yep. yep. I got shingles when I was 12 and I saw a scar. Ching from shingles? Yeah. yeah you, had I you think, had chicken pox before I that? I had it yeah. like a couple months yeah. ago, and they're really painful. It's very painful. Yeah. It runs along nerve endings. Like, it's extremely I had them on Usually my, it runs across. I have scars on my, on my yeah. side. Most right women right get it along their bra line on this nerve ending and underneath the breast. It's very, the very, very painful. I thought it was like stressy when it was like you can You can be triggered from stress, yeah. Okay. Yeah, you can. But again, you still have to be exposed to it. I mean, yeah. you know. I mean like not, it was It was kind of, it would feel itchy, so I would try to itch it, but it wouldn't itch. It would burn. burn. Exactly. Okay, any other general questions about infectious disease?